それではこれより分科会1人と動物の共通感染症。Now we like to start、uh, some cookie one discussion on emerging infections. The moderators are Associate Professor Atsushi Togawa, Infectious Disease, Fukuoka University Hospital, and Dr. Hiroshi Shimoda, Associate Professor, Veterinary Medicine, Yamaguchi University. Dr. Togawa, Dr. Shimoda, please. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to start the afternoon session on emerging infections. First lecture. Is to be given by Dr. Yasuyuki Kato. Dr. Kato、uh, is a professor at the University,、uh, International University of Health and Welfare, especially with regard to the、uh, imported infections such as Ebola, is his expertise. We have received his video lecture, so we'd like to start now. 国際医療福祉大学医学部の加藤と申します。I am Kato from International University of Health and Welfare. Thank you very much for inviting me to the International Forum today. I'd like to thank everyone involved. My topic is the recent progress on case management of emerging viral infections. Now, let me start. This chart shows the major emerging viral infections over the past 20 years. 2003 saw the outbreak of a new type of pneumonia in Guangdong province, China, which was soon identified as a novel infectious disease caused by an animal derived coronavirus called SARS. Fortunately, this epidemic ended within a few months, but it was followed by an outbreak of avian influenza H5N1. This is an avian influenza virus that is highly pathogenic to chickens and others, but it is now known to cause severe pneumonia in rare cases in humans. The main area of outbreak was Southeast Asia. There were concerns that this avian influenza virus could become a human influenza virus that could easily infect people and cause a pandemic. And this is when the novel influenza countermeasures were strongly promoted. In fact, the 2009 outbreak was a flu. Caused by a novel virus of the H1N1 subtype, thought to have originated in Mexico. Shortly after this flu came to an end, one of the largest ever Ebola epidemics broke out in Africa in 2004. This may also be fresh in your mind. Then, at the end of 2019, a new respiratory infection, a novel coronavirus infection, broke out in Wuhan, China. This is still a pandemic and a public health crisis that we are facing. These emerging viral infections, especially those with a high fatality rate and human to human transmission, can be divided into two major groups. The first is viral hemorrhagic fevers, such as Ebola. Bleeding symptoms tend to be emphasized, as the name implies, but in reality, In addition to gastrointestinal symptoms such as vomiting and diarrhea, multiple organ failure is thought to be responsible for the high fatality rate. The route of infection is through contact with the blood and body fluids of the patient or the bodies 
of the deceased. Since the infection cannot spread without direct contact with body fluids, infection control measures can end the epidemic. It is considered to be containable. The other group that causes pneumonia, such as COVID-19 we are currently experiencing, includes SARS and novel influenza. They are collectively called severe acute respiratory infections. It is often seen in a large number of people with mild illnesses, but in severe cases, it can cause pneumonia as shown in this radiograph. Some patients require oxygen administration or artificial vent ventilation. The route of infection is by inhaling droplets or aerosols generated during conversation or coughing. It can become infectious at or before the onset of illness and can lead to a large scale epidemic in a short period of time. It can also cause a worldwide epidemic, which is called a pandemic. The measures to be taken against these two major groups of infectious diseases, or the measures to be taken in the event of an epidemic, can be roughly summed up in these four basic policies. This four-point plan was put in place when a new task force was set up by the United Nations as well as the WHO in response to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014. Number one is to prioritize the treatment of patients. This is actually a breakthrough. Rather than the treat treatment of patients, contact tracing may be conducted to break the chain of infection. This is active epidemiological surveillance number two, which makes an inseparable team with case management. This order is based on our experience that prioritizing patient care first can help stabilize society and gain the cooperation of local residents. Number three, a safe burial is more important in cases of viral hemorrhagic fever. This may include vaccination, also in the case of COVID-19. That is number four, a social mobilization. By taking these measures, we try to end the epidemic and reduce the damage caused by the epidemic. Now, I would like to move on to my topic today, the treatment of patients. One key phrase may be from isolation to the best medical care. In Japan, the infectious disease control law was replaced by the new law in 1999. Under the old infectious disease control law, the emphasis was on breaking the chain of infection by isolating the patients themselves from their families, for example and not so much on their treatment. One of the reasons is that there is no good treatment for emerging infections. However, it has been recognized that giving patients the best treatment possible is the most useful way to combat infection, stabilizing the society, 
and getting the cooperation of the public or residents. This photograph was taken when I participated in Ebola response in Uganda, Africa in 2012. On the left is the ward where suspected patients are housed, and on the right is the ward when patients with confirmed diagnosis are admitted. At that time, the treatment for Ebola was to give fluids to prevent dehydration, but IV fluids were usually not given in principle because of the high risk of infection to the medical staff. Not much else was being done, which was common about 10 years ago. I mentioned earlier that there was a major epidemic in West Africa in 2014. At that time, efforts were made to provide as much medical care as possible to the patients. In the treatment unit in Monrovia, where I was staying, there was an attempt to provide IV fluids to the patients as much as possible. Also, in the larger treatment facilities, laboratories were being set up to perform PCR tests for diagnosis and to quickly provide results at the patient's bedside. In addition to the PCR for diagnosis, we were also able to check the kidney and liver functions at the bedside so that the content of IV fluids could be adjusted accordingly. The IV infusions I just mentioned are very important as supportive care but since it is an infectious disease, it would be better if there were drugs against the pathogen. There was no therapeutic drug for Ebola until then. However, since the 2014 epidemic, clinical trials have started in which drugs that were proven to be effective in animal experiments are administered to patients. This requires, for example, an ethical review or a third party's proper evaluation to ensure that uh, there is no disadvantage to the patient. In order to conduct these clinical trials, you need a lot of materials, resources, and staff to support the medical professionals. In Africa, where the Ebola epidemic breaks out and the access is very limited, you can imagine how difficult it is to conduct these clinical trials. Since epidemics occurs suddenly, this is a list of drugs that we have prepared in advance and have confirmed their effectiveness. Among monoclonal antibodies, the latter has been approved in Europe and the US because of its confirmed efficacy. As for RNA, polymerase inhibitors, the efficacy of remdesivir and the favipiravir has been investigated. Although they have not been shown to be effective against Ebola, they're actually being used for COVID-19 
In particular, remdesivir has been confirmed to be effective and is being used for patients with COVID-19 in patients, the US and Europe. Vaccines have also been developed and there is now an approved vaccine against Ebola hemorrhagic fever. I have listed the uh, adenovirus vector vaccines here. This technology has also been used for vaccines against uh, SARS-CoV-2, which probably helped to develop vaccines rapidly. But supportive care, supportive care was mentioned in the treatment of a respiratory failure patient as artificial ventilation. For severer case of respiratory failure, we may use membrane type artificial lung, which is also called ECMO, ECMO. ECMO treatment for patients, it requires trained staff as well as specialized facilities. ECMO facilities in number have increased since 2009. 2009 was the year with pandemic influenza. This newly emerged influenza caused severe respiratory failure in many young people, obese patients, patients with underlying diseases who are often talked about with the new coronavirus infection, as well as pregnant women. In order to save such patients, worldwide efforts have been made to mobilize ECMO for newly emerging viral infection treatment. In case it happens in Japan, many people worked hard to put infrastructure in place. Then this new coronavirus infection pandemic occurred. However, we see one big problem when treating patients with best medical care, that is infection of healthcare professionals or their occupational infection. Meaning to say when treating patients, caring patients, staff may inhale aerosol and get infected. This is a photo taken in the hospital ward in Singapore in 2003, when medical staff was taking care of SARS patients, despite their own risk, trying to save lives of patients. Now, there are so many healthcare professionals working in this context worldwide, including Japan. The 2003 SARS pandemic was very special. I would like to show you why global case count was 8,000. Compared to current COVID-19 pandemic, that number seems to be small, but the fatality rate on the next column is as high as 10%. And 20% of the case count is that of healthcare professionals. This rate is uh, around 20% in regions with large number of patients, but in other regions such as Canada, Singapore, and Vietnam, the rate was as high as 40 to 50%. SARS did not show community-wide spread. Most of SARS spread was within the medical institutions. That's how it happened. 
Current spread of COVID-19 strongly suggests community-acquired infection, widespread of household infection has been reported. However, at the beginning of this pandemic around 2020, in March, April, and May, about 20% of the cases reported to WHO was that of healthcare professionals. It seems they got infected during treatment and care of infected patients. When pandemic started, there were many factors causing this, such as a shortage of PPE disease, had many unknown factors and so on. But what we can see is that quite a number of healthcare professionals may get infected in the initial stage. And it is a tremendous challenge to prevent infection, secure the safety of healthcare professionals, as well as treating patients as much as possible. Then what are the likely situations to cause medical staff infection? Here are some examples of aerosol generating procedures. For example, in order to treat a patient with artificial ventilation, intubation into trachea must be done, or even at the stage before intubation, manual oxygenation procedure is performed. These procedures generate aerosol with pathogens. Staff working nearby may get infected when they got inhale such aerosol. What are the measures taken in order to prevent such infection? First, countermeasure to reduce infectious sources. Put infected patients to a limited number of facilities. Two facilities specialized in this kind of treatment. In Japan, there are designated medical institutions for the care of infection. Put patients together in special facilities. However, there are too many number of patients with COVID-19. This method is no longer practical. In terms of hospital facility, patients are admitted to special rooms with negative pressure where room air is less likely to leak out. There are operational approaches to reduce HCP infection. Train staff for infection control, teach safer technique and procedure when treating patients, and vaccinate staff. HCP vaccination has been prioritized. Vaccination can prevent infection. As a sort of last resort, PPPE use. PEPE stands for personal protection equipment. Use of gowns and shields can reduce risk of infection. These four measures are used for infection control. I have mentioned safer technique for aerosol generating uh, procedures. This requires staff training. This is a photo taken at the Rinku General Medical Center in Osaka in 2019, immediately before the outbreak of COVID-19. This is a scene of staff training session. The center sent some of their staff to a medical institution in Germany which had the Ebola hemorrhage fever experience. Some designated institutions for infectious diseases have had 
preparedness uh, training like this. Our group with research grant from Ministry of Health have been actively supporting designated institutions for infectious diseases for the past 10 years. We have been offering training programs, performing mutual assessments among institutions. We also publish treatment guide or manuals for HCP. We published the COVID-19 treatment guide and keep updating information for HCPs. Before COVID-19 pandemic, there were various global efforts, which include clinical trials, preparing intensive care facilities, and so forth. With the emergence of COVID-19, various countries and regions started clinical trials not only WHO, but also many other organizations are participating in clinical trials. Clinical trials have been able to establish so-called standard care for COVID-19. For moderate to severe cases with pneumonia or respiratory failure, respiratory therapy is the key oxygen administration artificial ventilation are important treatment regimen nosocomial infection which was a great concern during SARS pandemic has been better controlled nowadays in the Ebola treatment section i mentioned antiviral agents such as remdesivir exhibited the efficacy in treating COVID-19. Its use has been widely spread. Also, neutralizing antibody agents, which were mentioned as monoclonal antibody in Ebola treatment. There are multiple developments in this category. Pups combined use of two agents, which is also called the cocktail therapy, has been also introduced. More importantly, for moderate to severe cases, we have learned that uh, suppressing inflammation, inflammation caused by our, our body's immune response, improve prognosis. Better than suppressing viral them, virus themselves. For this purpose, steroids, and other immunosuppressants are sometimes used. These standard therapies are actively used in many Japanese medical institutions nowadays. Here's the summary of today's talk. First, I reviewed major staking for the past 20 years against emerging viral infections, especially new type influenza of 2009 and Ebola hemorrhage fever outbreaks since 2014. These cases have accumulated knowledge for tr clinical trials and improved intensive care infrastructures. As we face COVID-19, pandemic lessons learned are exhibiting the results. This would further strengthen and improve our medical infrastructure, although we have made efforts to improve treatments for new infectious diseases, especially as designated uh, medical institutions for infectious diseases pandemic of this magnitude presents new challenges to our medical system. Thank you, Dr. Kato. Thank you very much, Dr. Kato. We'd like to move on to the next speech by Dr. Kato. Dr. Kano, uh, Dr. Shigeyuki Kano is a director, Department of Tropical Medicine and Malaria Research Institute of National Center for Global Health and Medicine. He's one of the distinguished 
experts in this field. The title of his speech lecture is Elimination of Such Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Diseases as Human Malaria by 2030. Now, Dr. Kano, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Togawa and Dr. Shimoda. And uh, I would like to be uh, thank for this uh, invitation. Now, let me start uh, my talk with the current trend of malaria infection in the world. Last year, in December 6, the WHO uh, published the malaria report. This is an annual report uh, covering the trend of infection until the, the past year. And uh, I'm showing the 2015 to 2020. This is the number of deaths, as you can see, from 2015 to 2020, both have been increasing. However, in 2015, WHO set a target to reduce malaria by 2030. This is a global technical strategy for malaria. And this was established with a target of the following. 2015 is a baseline, and uh, by 2020, 40% reduction in the number of cases, 75 reduction by 25, and 90% reduction by 30. This is a very ambitious goal. But uh, in 2020, as you can see, we have not really reduced it by 40%. It is actually increasing by 7.6%, and the number of deaths is also increasing by 11%. COVID-19 pandemic started in 2019. This is part of the factor, but uh, this um, excess uh, death out of those, um, approximately two thirds, 47,000, were basically related to the delay and suspension of um, treatment and diagnosis during COVID-19. So we were disappointed, but uh, WHO within this report said that the uh, situation could have been worse. At the time of the beginning of a pandemic, WHO expected that uh, in the sub-Saharan uh, Africa, malaria death would um, potentially double in 2020. That was the expectation. But malaria programs were uh, implemented with urgent action in many countries, and we could avert this worst case scenario. So the comment is very actually positive. And according to the latest data that we have, endemic in 85 countries and the 241 million episodes and the 427,000 deaths. What's really important is that the 95% of episodes and the 96% of deaths were reported in Sub-Saharan Africa. And out of those, 80% were among the children under the age of five. Malaria is a disease of uh, children in Africa. That is the current situation. In terms of a uh, number of deaths, this is calculated by a uh, population of 1,000. And uh, as you can see in the color code in Nigeria, 27%. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. And uh, DRC 12%, Mozambique 4%, Uganda 5%. In dark highlighted areas, there is a high density of uh, malaria episodes, Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Despite the low population and the fewer number of cases in terms of density, uh, it is very high. So these are some of the areas in the world. And today's theme is uh, One Health. We need to pay special attention to the uh, semi-malaria parasites affecting uh, the people. At the bottom, you can see the evolution of uh, the simian malaria parasites. And then the blue one is uh, bird, green is uh, mice, 
and the human is uh, red, non human primate is um, brown. Two million years ago, people started to walk on two legs and uh, started to split from the uh, monkey, and then we have uh, started contracting uh, this um, parasite. First of all, it went to gorilla, but then it came to humans. And uh, these uh, parasites, we are now uh, more resistant to that, but to the gorilla, gorilla strain or the line is still affecting us. So this is actually quite specific. For example, if a Japanese macaque is um, infected by a different type of parasite, uh, no infection would occur. But the Plasmodium which used to infect um, rhesus monkey and the Cynomolgus monkey, and currently there is a spread of that in Southeast uh, Asia. So as uh, people start to destroy the forest and uh, accidental spillover is uh, observed uh, quite frequently from uh, monkeys to people. And um, there are many um, simian malaria parasites already known. For example, in Southeast Asia, we have a Placidum cymology, which is the most common, and then uh, Guinui and the Plasmodium nosei is actually widely spread, as you can see on the next slide. Highlighted in purple, you can find the human infection case of a Plasmodium nosei. And uh, in the yellow sections, uh, short-tailed monkeys live. And uh, if they have um, the Anopheles um, mosquitoes there, and people moving around there, uh, there is a spillover in 20, or in Malaysia, in 2013, more than 300 cases uh, reported in Malaysia. And according to PCR, we can now definitely diagnose uh, this. Cambodia, Vietnam, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, we have seen reports there as well. And it seems that the it is spreading to the continent as well. Laos was uh, free of infection, but we did a field work and reported the first case. So we did a sequencing and the two trees were drawn from there. And the cytochrome B antigen based uh, tree, phylogenetic tree, and then B1 antigen based uh, sequencing B, two of them are shown. And uh, in the left, maybe it was coming from Thailand, but uh, according to B, it seems to be coming from um, Malaysia. So molecular uh, epidemiology is not fully established for this. Um, family. But uh, anyway, malaria parasites uh, that is um, rampant in Southeast Asia is uh, spreading. This is a concern. By 2030, how can we make sure that uh, there is a 90% reduction? How can we achieve this goal? And in the World Malaria Report, WHO is talking about new tool and new approaches and better implementation of existing ones. What do we do? There are four specific strategies. First of all, long-lasting insecticide in treated nets should be used. And uh, by the use of these nets, we can prevent the infection. Um, the second is development of sensitive diagnostic methods. So surveillance and monitoring and evaluation in the to do this, we need a sensitive uh, diagnostic methods. And third is a proper treatment with atemisinin-based combination therapy. Uh, this is a new type of uh, drug. And number four is 
implementation of RDSS vaccine, which was developed newly. And I would like to talk about one of them one by one. How does it contribute to the reduction of uh, vectors? And uh, you can see that this uh, reduction decline is contributed by uh, in the residual spray in purple. If you spray the room, the mosquito after sucking the blood would uh, uh, stay on the wall and die. And uh, there's also long lasting insecticidal nets. And if you sleep within the nets, you can minimize the spread of uh, malaria infections. And uh, these two contribute to approximately 80% of the reduction of number of patients with malaria. And uh, only 20% is uh, due to pharmacological treatment. But um, right now, we begin to see more mosquitoes that are resistant to these uh, drugs. And the DDT was uh, used for indoor spraying, but uh, because of uh, resistance as well as the environmental issues, a new drugs were developed, malathion, carbamate, and the parethroid. Every 10 years, uh, we saw new drugs coming out. But after that, for a while, a um, new class of uh, insecticides were not made. And uh, for the first time in 40 years, IRS, uh, uh, and from, this is a uh, shield from Sumitomo, and also Interceptor G2 uh, were developed uh, for mosquito nets in order to deal with um, drug resistant vectors. And now we have um, these used quite widely. So with mosquito nets and the IRS, we're hoping to see better results outcome of um, malaria countermeasures. With regard to the tests, such as microscopy or immunochromatography, or when you drop a uh, drop of blood uh, in several minutes, uh, we can see that whether it is positive or not. And this uh, equipment is used worldwide, but these two, unfortunately, are not sensitive enough. RDT uh, requires 100 parasites in one microliter, and microscopy requires 50 per mil for detection. And these two methods can detect in a very tip of iceberg on the water. When patients comes to a clinic with symptoms, then these two methods can be used. But uh, when the number of parasites are much smaller, or when uh, they are the carriers of the parasites, we will not be able to capture these uh, cases under the water with these two methods. That was the thinking in the past. Now, in Japan, a new uh, system was developed by Sysmex. Uh, this is an automated blood cell analyzer, XN31. If you press the switch in one minute, it will show the results of analysis. 50 parasites uh, per mil uh, will suffice for the detection. In Japan, uh, this is approved two years ago, and since last year, uh, this is recognized as a registered diagnosis under the Japanese infectious disease control law. And so in Japan, uh, in place of RDT and microscopy, XM31 is used for diagnosis and registration of the cases. Aiken Chemical developed uh, this unit, uh, which is also used for the diagnosis of uh, COVID cases, and it's used for malaria also. The blood is mixtures with uh, solution and uh, 
nucleic acid is detected in a very speedy manner, and the positivity can be confirmed with naked eye like this, with this lamp method. We uh, believe uh, that some parasites that were difficult to detect uh, may be detected now. With regard to the treatment, Artemisia Chinhao in the Chinese medicine was described in a document 2000 years ago. It works for this uh, disease. From this plant, Artemisia, uh, the extract was obtained and the chemical structure was determined. And then, as shown here, it's established as a formulation, and this was used worldwide. In 2015, uh, this was resulted in a Nobel Awards. Because of uh, resistance to the drug, uh, let me describe why this artemisin is important. It works for multi-drug resistance parasites and uh, works for severe disease and the side effect is limited and uh, uh, it can be used in different formulations uh, such as uh, the IV and the uh, oral medication. In order to extend the uh, use the life of artemisin as long as possible, we have some combination therapies with artemisin. In case uh, resistant parasites are existing in patients, the partner drug can work for that uh, to prevent the transmission of the disease to other individuals. So that is the uh, current uh, strategy of uh, pharmacotherapy, and the WHO does not support the monotherapy use of this uh, product, and uh, this should be used until 2030. Number four is a vaccine. Last year, GlaxoSmithKline developed uh, vaccine for malaria and finally approved by the WHO. This uh, parasite is detected from the salivary gland and when they enter the blood to prevent them from entering the liver, this vaccine works. On the surface of sporozoid, as shown here, very long circumsporozoid protein exists in the center, we have uh, asparagin alanine, asparagin chlorine structure for amino acids uh, lined in a continuous or repeated manner. And this area is targeted by this vaccine. The last part, the 14 repetition, it's separated, and the, this is the structure of B cell epitope. When antibody is attached here, uh, the uh, it will prevent the parasite from entering the patient's body. And this vaccine is used with this carrier. So it came for a long history of 40 years to reach the development of vaccination. The, we started from the very left. It's a vaccination of radio. After the radiotherapy and uh, H201, These two combination and AS02, AS01 combination vaccine is the one currently used. Worldwide, already in Kenya and Malawi, 
this vaccine was uh, tried and used in more than 800,000 children. The efficacy was around 30-40%. With this vaccine, can we stop uh, the epidemic of uh, malaria? We may be able to use uh, this vaccine in these countries, but in a very poor countries, when they do not have uh, pesticides or the nets. If we can, we really use uh, this vaccine three times in advance. Uh, if uh, this vaccine is too expensive, uh, then we wish to purchase insecticide or nets uh, before that. So whether the vaccine is used in a prioritized manner or not, uh, I feel it may be questionable. So with these measures, the objective is to achieve this goal by 2030. My last slide is my drawing of uh, John P. He is a god from uh, ancient China and the emperor uh, Genso. Uh, when there was a disease, uh, malaria, this god came along to treat the disease. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kano. Uh, that was a very educational lecture. We have a couple of questions, if we may. Earlier, you talked about the uh, insecticides, nets, or other drugs, and early diagnosis also. Number of uh, patients in Africa disease dis decreased. Now, after 2015, uh, there was an increasing of the patients in number. Was there any reason behind that? Those measures are not working, or the, were there some difficulties in those countermeasures? In individual reports to cover the spread of malaria cases, we see some successes, but in some other areas, we do not have a working functional uh, reporting systems, and sometimes cases are reported later on. In and the rapid diagnostic test was broadly used, and the number of uh, cases tested are now increasing compared to those days of uh, microscopy. So it's kind of a similar situation with the current uh, pandemic. Tests and diagnosis are gradually used broadly uh, to better capture the current status. So it's not that uh, strategies against malaria are failing. Thank you. Including the permitrine, um, insecticide uh, infused nets should be used continuously, and also the treatment, early treatment, should be promoted through the use of drugs. And uh, somehow by 2030, you want to achieve the target. Yes. We also have to strengthen the underlying. Um, health system so that we can use that system for novel uh, infectious diseases as well. So health system reinforcement is uh, attracting uh, quite a lot of attention these days. I see. So hopefully the developed nations can provide more cooperation, international contribution. I believe that's uh, going to be important. Yes. Uh, in rich nations, if it uh, makes sense, there's a lot of the treatment, but um, we also need to make sure that the access to treatment is available in poorer nations as well, so that nobody will left behind for the SDGs 
goals. Yes, that's a very important aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. Thank you. We would like to move on to the next presentation. The lecturer, Kun Tsien Tsai. Dr. Tsai, Professor Tsai, is with the Department of Public Health at the National Taiwan University. His research, uh, research includes wicked Tosis or dengue fever in Taiwan. Today's title is given here, Vector von Vegetosis in Taiwan. Please, Professor Tsai. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my great honor to share our study in Taiwan. Um, my topic is uh, vector bone rickettsiosis in Taiwan. My name is Kun Xian Tsai from Institute of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences and also the Department of Public Health, National Taiwan University. So today I will talk about the vector, not only the zoonosis, but the vector bone zoonosis in Taiwan. So about the rickettsiosis, we know that the rickettsiosis is an infection caused by rickettsia. The rickettsia is a kind of bacteria, very small. Usually they are small, applied intracellular gram-negative bacteria. And uh, their classification is about the family rickettsiaceae and the family anaplasmataceae. Usually um, in the field, we um, infect by the um, rickettsia, usually by the vector, including the tick, flea, lice, and also the mice. So from the figure you can see, usually in our house, our domestic animals, we contact with them. If they are clear without any ectoparasites, then we are free. But if we have some opportunity to visit in the field, we may contact with a lot of wild animals and also their ectoparasites. That's the risk. So it's uh, my main topic, rickettsiosis in Taiwan. So this is shows the global view. You can see lots of study have mentioned about a rickettsia infection, especially in the um, United States, the North America, and also the South of America, in the, the African country and the European. In Asia area, we know a lot of um, rickettsia species, including the Siberica, Heilongjiang genesis, and also the Japonica, and some conorized strains in Asia. And the uh, very famous, the scrub typhus, Tsutsukamushi, it's uh, very popular in Eastern um, Asia, also in Taiwan. So later on, I will talk about the um, rickettsia studies in Taiwan, not only the scoptypus, but also others. So this is Taiwan. Usually by the official classification, we divide Taiwan into five districts in the north, central, south, and the Gaoping and the eastern and also Taipei area. So when we conduct some studies in Taiwan, usually we will have a, a country-wide surveillance or uh, focus on one district. Okay, Taiwan is very close to the Japan. So uh, welcome all the audience and the, the people, scientists to visit Taiwan. We can have some um, city tours. Okay, so um, I used to work for Taiwan CDC, Centers for Disease Control. We know that the reportable disease have a lot of infections, infectious pathogens, but Focus on the notable vector bone diseases in Taiwan. You can see the table. Most of the diseases are transmitted by the mosquitoes, including the dengue, Japanese encephalitis, chikungunya, Zika virus, and also the West Nile, and also the previous speaker mentioned about the malaria. They are um, transmitted by the mosquitoes, including the uh, virus and also the parasites. 
Um, today, my work and my talk will focus on the rickettsia. So you can see the red words about the scrub typhus, epidemic typhus fever, and also endemic typhus fever. And today, we will also include a, a speaker talking about the severe fever of thrombocytopenia syndrome. Um, we have one uh, human case one years ago, so this is also an important tick-borne virus in Taiwan. So I will introduce the three top um, rickettsia disease in Taiwan and now has been listed as a reportable disease. The first is the epidemic typhus fever. Um, till now, no indigenous epidemic typhus fever cases in past 10 years. And because of the, the public health improvement, so it is not easy to collect the body lines in local residents. So from the figure, you will see that the, the major disease is transmitted by the body lines. The second is the endemic typhus fever. Okay, in Taiwan per year, we usually will confirm about uh, 30 to 37 confirmed cases per year. And you can see the located area major in central Taiwan and the southern or the Gaoping area of Taiwan. And uh, some people appeared in northern Taiwan was infected. So it's a endemic typhus fever in Taiwan, the situation. And we also know the ectoparasites, the red fleas. The red fleas usually hover on the rodents but sometimes we can find the, the ectoparasites on our companion, including the dog and also the cats. The third is very important about the scrub typhus. Um, as we know, in Taiwan, we have, uh, usually we will have uh, 500 confirmed cases per year. So it's the, the major vector bone rickettsiosis in Taiwan. And then we also identify the major vectors, including the Leptostromidium, Thalians, Impalum, and the Scularis, and also Palladium, the major vectors for transmitting the Orangia Sugamushi. You can see that the major cases appeared in the Eastern Taiwan. And from the figure eight, you will find that uh, usually the cases will be um, infected by the chigger mites. Only the chigger mites can transmit the orangea tsukamushi. And in the field, you will find a lot of uh, chiggers hover on rodents or the mouse in the field. That's the current situation in Taiwan. So when I work for Taiwan CDC, I try to set up some um, clinical methods, not only the PCR or the ELISA or the IFA, I set up a, um, isolation methods, we call the show valve technique. So you can see from the the, um, the phylogenetic tree, <clears throat> we found that the very diverse strand appeared in Taiwan, including the Kapu, Kuroki, Kato, and the Kawasaki strands of the orange Suzukamushi in Taiwan. So it's a really diverse species in Taiwan, all the strains are isolated from the humans. But when I work for the Orangea Sukamushi, some question is really curious for me. For example, if you see the figure, you will see a lot of reported case, more than 3000. But after the clinical diagnostic, you will find only 500 cases were confirmed. So my question is that, are there any other unrecognized rickettsiosis appeared in Taiwan? Because all the cases were de delivered by the medical doctor. The doctor said that oh, all the cases have the um, similar clinical symptoms, including the fever, headache, malaria, rash, and also the elevated level of liver enzymes. So. According to this um, evidence, I think most of these are really caused by the rickettsia infection, but do they all the scrub typhus? Maybe not. So we have some obligation and some responsibility to confirm, to identify and to prove the evidence. 
this is the first human case of uh, other um, rickettsia infection. We call the rickettsia fetus. Um, that's the 2008 uh, paper from the Southern Taiwan. We found that the old woman who was um, um, report, report to Taiwan CDC, who is the, the scoptitis infection. However, we found the DNA from the blood and you know, we also do the serological analysis. We found that the antibodies against rickettsia fetus have a full four increasing label. So that's the first human case of uh, rickettsia fetus in Taiwan other than scrub typhus. So from now on, from that time, we try to put more efforts on the screening of the rickettsia fetus, especially people who are living with the companion so that's the first uh, um, retrospective study by my master students, Yang Wan Xiu, last year. We published the data on pros NTD. We recruit uh, a 122 febrile patient reported to Taiwan CDC. All the cases are scope typhus suspected, but uh, most of them are negative results. Within the among the cases, we found that uh, eight cases were possible rickettsia fetus infection for our acute patient. And we found the DNA and also found the, the, the serological antibodies. And within the four peoples, uh, 49 year old males returning from China died from acute respiratory distress syndrome after doxycycline was discontinued. Because the case was um, judged, they are, he is not the, the scrub typhus. So the medical doctor decided to stop to provide the doxycycline. So after one week, the case was dead. So that's a very important information that the rickettsia infection could cause the death and the fatal cases. That's the Northern Taiwan. And uh, our colleague in the Southern Taiwan, a Dr. Lai, a medical doctor, who also uh, noticed this result. So he tried to enroll the patient in Southern Taiwan. Among 400 patients, he found that uh, three cases with acute infection and the three cases of uh, past infection of the rickettsia fetus by the methods of immunophorians, they say, we call the IFA, IFA, okay? So from now on, we know that all the Taiwan, we have the possible the human zero preference of rickettsia fetus exposure. But do we have the rickettsia fetus or the ectoparasites in Taiwan? Yes. According to our colleague data, we found that about 44 um, cat fleas were infected, impact, infected by the, the rickettsia. And we also found that the rickettsia fetus can be detected in the carefree year round. And we also found the, the, the stray cats with the carefree, they can have the IgG antibodies against the rickettsia fetus. So from the animals, from the vectors, from the host, we have all the data. So it confirms that it's also an important vector bone rickettsiosis in Taiwan. So we should provide more public health education to that the people, the, the residents know the companion is also important, not only human health, but also the animal health is important. So they can cope to our one health issue. Beyond the, the, the rickettsia, we also have uh, more data about the spotty fever group rickettsia. But in Taiwan CDC, we do not, we do not list this pathogen, this disease as a reportable disease. But in the 2009, we have a people, have a resident with, uh, uh, who returning from the, the South Africa, a national park, who was a reportable report as um, um, Q fever, scrub typhus. But after the laboratory diagnostic, we found that the case with the Rickettsia Africa DNA in her body. So after the serological study, we finally proved that the people was infected by the Rickettsia Africa in African country. So that's the first imported case from other country. So from now on, we focus 
and we put more efforts in the field study. Our colleague tried to collect the field ticks, including the exotic granulators, hemophysaloides, bendicoda, and also other ticks, who found that, yes, they did cover the SFG, spotty fever gluricachia, in the field. And our colleague also tried to analyze the host, the rodents. They found that the Rickettsia conori, Rickettsia japonica, Rickettsia rickettsi appeared in the rodent, including the um, Rattus rosea, Calodi, and also the other, a lot of the, the, the rodents. So it means that the Rickettsia, spotty fever Rickettsia did appear in the tick species and also the rodent host. By the an analysis of the, the, the serum from the rodents, they did find the positive symbol. So that's the current situation in Taiwan. So based on this basic data, I tried to use the show vial technique to isolate the pathogen in BSL-3 laboratory. Finally, we found that we have a TWKM123 and also the IG-1 novel species from Taiwan in the field. So it's the first data we found and we have this kind of pass antigen to detect this kind of pathogen. Our current study in the last year, we, um, we retrospective study, we used the, the serum collected from the Northern East Taiwan. You can see in the Northern East Taiwan near Taipei city, we enrolled about 1000 people and then we used the IFA, the immunofluorescence assay, and also combined with the ELISA. We found that about 6.8% of people have the antibodies against the spotty fever group rickettsia. So that's the first very, um, very severe the situation as we know currently. So we try to analyze to clarify what kind of um, rickettsia infection we also found that maybe, maybe they have a dual infection. For example, the rickettsia species have the, the typhus group rickettsia and also have the spotty fever group rickettsia caught infection in one person. So in this area, we now have this kind of current study. We also try to um, clarify the risk factors to prove and also to protect the local people. So we have some data about the age, also the sampling site and also the village and also their occupation to help them to, to provide the, the information. And we also collect some um, ectoparasites from the companion dogs. From the data, you can find that we collect about 184 ticks from dogs, including the brown ticks, Rapicephalus sanguineus, Rapicephalus, Cephalus, Hemophysaloides, and uh, also from the Dermacender oratus, Hemophysalis hystresis, Hemophysalis onisophila. That's a very interesting data. Most of the ticks, they can find, they cover the Rickettsia species, including the species we have, the TWKM1 and also the three, and we also found the novel species in Dermacenter oratus, but we don't know how uh, the, the real situation if any people was infected or exposure to this kind of catcher. Okay, this data shows that we do the molecular analysis. We try to amplify the, all the genes, the GALT A, the OM A, and OM B, and also SCA4 to prove the identity in the, of the, the species. So most of the gene sequence identity is out of the criteria. So it proved the data, maybe this, this species is very special in Taiwan. So now we put this um, species is a, a novel strain. If we can collect more species, more, more isolated from other area, then we can prove that as a novel species. Okay, this is the phylogenetic tree shows their um, diversity among currently the world distribution of KGI in the world, okay? And uh, during the analysis, 
especially the retrospective study by the PCR from the, the serum of the human case, especially the acute humans, we found that some people, although they are confirmed with the orange gamushi, but somehow the DNA of the blood contains some anaplasma, anaplasma phagocytophilium DNA. So we are interested, uh, these people called infected by the anaplasma. So we do some the serological screening. So we found that the in Kimen, about 31% of people got the antibodies against anaplasma. So among these samples, we try to do the PCR. We also detect the 16S DNA and the 44, P44 and the MSP2 DNA in two patients. So this data prove that in the Cayman Island, not only the, the scrub typhus preference, but also the human granulocytic anaplasmosis appeared. And one patient, one local resident, who also harbored the Ehrlichia chaffensis. So that's the currently we know in Cayman Island, we have the Orangia Tsukamushi and the anaplasma and also the chaffensis. So the take home message about the conclusion, um, scrub typhus remain the most common and the frequently um, reportable vector bone recidosis in Taiwan. Um, only 16.3% of the reported cases were confirmed by a laboratory diagnosis. And uh, we still know how, we don't know how much the suspected case may be caused by other recidosis infections. So it's our current work to do that. And the second is that the Rickettsia fetus infections have been identified in fleas, cat, dog, and also in the rodents and also humans. So that's the second information. The third is that the spotty fever group Rickettsia, it is not a reportable disease in Taiwan, but we continue to do the survey to accumulate the field data. Now the SFG Rickettsia have been reported in ticks and small mammals, but may be unrecognized in humans. Um, last year, we provided a thorough epidemiological study in the northern east of Taiwan, indicated that the exposure of the SFG rickettsia. So that's uh, important information. And the last is that we proved two human cases. One is the, the anaplasma infection, and the other is the Ehrlichia infection. So overall, these are the vector bone infectious disease. The scrub typhus is transmitted by the mites. Rickettsia fetus is transmitted by the flea. The spotty fever is major transmitted by the tick and also the anaplasma ehrlichia also by the ticks. So that's the current data we have in Taiwan. Because we are talking about the one health issue, so by the concept, used we mention the domestic animals because they have a close relationship with human. But now we should put more efforts on the rural transmission cycle because we have a lot of the opportunity to contact or exposure to the wild animals. So if they harbor the, the ectoparasites with the pathogens should be more emphasized. So I hope this short talk will be good and uh, some help to others. When we talk about the uh, health, we want to help the healthy humans. And also we need to know the environment to provide, to know the healthy animals and also the healthy environment, including the healthy ecosystems. In Japanese, we have a word that say wa, wa. In Chinese, we say he. In English, we can say that uh, maybe the harmony or the symbiosis. So I hope that we can put more efforts to do the surveillance, surveillance and accumulate more data to ensure the, the, all the, the ecosystems health. So that's my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tsai. So may I ask you, may I ask you some questions? Yes. So first of all, uh, I was very much impressed about the difference 
of our in the uh, epidemiology of the rickettsiosis between Taiwan and Japan, because uh, uh, as I as an infectious physician, I see less than ten cases of rickettsiosis in Japan, and uh, recent uh, surveillance data shows that uh, in Japan the number of the rickettsiosis are uh, mostly uh, basically the scrub typhus, as you said. And the number was uh, like, uh, 1,000 cases per year for several decades ago, but the number is around five cases per year recently. But uh, another rickettsiosis called the Japanese spotted fever is rapidly increasing. And it was uh, found, discovered around 30 years ago, but now uh, the Japanese spotted fever uh, is reported around 300 cases per year. So the number of the Japanese spotted fever is rapidly increasing, and uh, the number of the uh, Tsugamushi disease is almost halved uh, recently. So there's a, and as you said, in Taiwan, scrub typhus is a dominant uh, rickettsiosis, and the spotted fever group is uh, almost uh, like an imported uh, disease. So I think there's a very uh, much difference between the, the epidemiology. But uh, do you think that uh, the difference is maybe based on the uh, uh, difference in the distri distribution of the uh, ticks, uh, the vector, uh, the different kind of vector may be distributed in the, uh, in between Taiwan and Japan? Uh, do you have uh, any idea about this? Yes, I, I think it's reasonable because the species of the ticks is uh, different between Taiwan and also Japan. For example, we now talking about the, for example, the SFTSV infection. Mm -hmm. Only the the ticks of the um, Emma cypha loides longi longi cornis species you used it only appeared in Japan area, but recently we have a vocalic find the species appear in Taiwan. It's a, mm -hmm. about uh, maybe the new records. So um, under the global climate change and also the, the, the transportation. So I think the, the tick species is also important. And also we have some animal transportation maybe affect the real situation in Taiwan. So because uh, uh, we didn't have the um, full data about the field. So now we try to set up some surveillance plan in Northern and in Southern Taiwan to follow the real situation. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, another question uh, is about uh, 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 patient uh, characteristics. And uh, uh, when I uh, ask uh, the patients of rickettsiosis, uh, because uh, it's difficult to uh, diagnose the disease, uh, like a point of care test by point of care, point of care test. Uh, usually, we have to rely on the patient history to diagnose the rickettsiosis in a, in a clinical situation. And uh, one question that I rely most is uh, like uh, the patient's uh, work, uh, the occupation, and. Uh, for example, if the patient is working on, uh, in agriculture or in forestry, uh, the, uh, the, rickettsiosis may, the possibility of the rickettsiosis may be higher. And uh, in most cases, the patients are actually working in the forest. Uh, and uh, have you seen the similar uh, tendency or characteristics? districts yeah. in Taiwan? Yes, most of the case, they have the history. Maybe they are the vet or, or the agricultural worker, or mm -hmm. they have some history to go outside to have the field savory, some kind of that. But we also found that the, some people, they hover the domestic animal. They carry on the domestic animal to field, but carry back. The, mm -hmm. the different the tick species from the field. So that's all can be found. And now we also encourage the, the point of care if they can use some rapid test to do if they are rickettsia, if they are orangea to gamushi or not, they can have the first in, 
in, in information to treat the, the, the patients. So in Taiwan, now we try to develop some um, rapid test to differentiate the um, scrub typhus and the spotty fever group rickettsiosis, just like that. Oh, thank you. It's very, very uh, informative. And uh, it's, uh, if such a point of care test is available also in Japan, it will be very helpful to diagnose uh, uh, rickettsiosis patients. So thank you very much for your very uh, valuable uh, lecture. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Next, following three presentations, I, Shimada, would like to moderate the session. Next, we would like to have uh, Professor Tetsuya Mizutani, Center for Infectious Diseases Epidemiology and the Prevention Research at Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. He's presentation titled as where does the next emerging virus come from professor Ms. Dani, please take the floor thank you moderator no one health oxai forum 2022 thank you very much and i'd like to thank this opportunity to speak i changed the title of my presentation a couple of times, but uh, my topic is the how we can uh, see the undetected virus for the future. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus I have to cover to a certain degree. So this is going to be the basis for future prediction. In the morning session, I understand that the SARS-CoV-2 has covered already, but in my talk also, I'd like to talk about the uh, character of this uh, Omicron strain variant, and then where, I mean, the place or the animals is uh, the emerging of the next virus we are going to see. And of course, we have to think about the countermeasures against uh, new emerging viruses. I'd like to touch upon our research results as well. SSTSV is the topic probably covered by next speaker, Dr. Shimojima. So I'm not going to talk about the SFTS and also with regard to the specific uh, methods, I understand that will be covered by uh, Dr. Horie, the speaker after that. So I'm not uh, touching that topic either. First of all, Omicron strain, I have to cover. When I prepare this uh, slide, uh, this shows a number of new patients and the number of deaths in Japan. as of uh, 16th of January, and uh, we start to see an uh, increase. That is a sixth wave of a pandemic uh, in Japan. And at that time, the number of uh, uh, new patients were almost the same as that of a fifth wave. If you look at the fifth wave, at the time, number of deaths seemed much smaller, which was good. And uh, we often heard uh, that the uh, Omicron is just like another influenza or the, that's the attenuated virus. But uh, this is a data from Friday, uh, the day after, the day before yesterday. and. Uh, Unfortunately, we see an increase of uh, new patients as well as the number of deaths. Number of deaths exceeded that of a fifth wave. So at this moment, it's not that the Omicron is just like another virus for common cold. We need to maintain our caution measures 
And some people say it's a totally different virus, but rather, I would say, we say that the Omicron did not start from Delta strain, but still, it's within the uh, continuation of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, if you look at the world, again, we see an increase of number of patients and the number of tests seem to be smaller. These numbers are as of January 12th and the fatality rate was 0.2%. Uh, and this two percent rather and this was at the time of last thursday and it seemed that uh, we had a peak out in number of cases unlike in japan number of deaths is not increasing much as you can see the fatality rate was two percent globally if my calculation is correct this is based on the calculation number of deaths divided by the number of uh, infected globally for example in japan and in us we see a reasonable number or reasonably high number of uh, deaths in us and japan but that is not the case in other countries so we may not be able to capture the actual nature or characters of Omicron yet. These are the dates uh, confirmed and identified by WHO for each strain or variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2. As you may know, we have Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and uh, it took several months after confirmation to the registration or identification by WHO. And this uh, period was rather shorter for Omicron. Omicron was recognized by WHO soon after its detection. Now, what uh, kind of uh, mutation we have on virus? This is alpha strain and this is a spike protein. And this is where we have mutations and alpha strain from UK and the N501 one Y uh, forms its character. This is Delta. It has mutations as shown here, less than 10 mutations in spike proteins in the past strains or variants. Now this is Omicron. As you can see, uh, much larger number, three times, four times more uh, of uh, mutations in spike protein. So the person who see this in genome sequencing uh, saw this as a significant alert. As such, Omicron shows quite a large number of mutations, mainly in spike proteins. You may have seen this uh, chart already in spike protein receptor binding domains or RVDs are the area for mutations such as increase the effectivity or escape from neutralizing antibody and the past strains they have two or three mutations but the omicron has more now this is related to my theme uh, today where did Omicron come from? In South Africa, it was first discovered, but actually it seemed considered to be uh, generated or uh, happened from uh, Botswana in 2021. And uh, April or May, that is probably the timing of its start with regard to the theory of mutation of a virus when they have more people infected and the replication number increases there's higher likelihood of mutations so it's probably didn't start from south africa it started from somewhere else in africa and it was 
a cold or detected in South Africa. In case of Omicron, we are not sure if it's really started in Botswana or not, but immediately before that, there was a large uh, pandemic outbreak in Botswana. So probably at that time, the South Africa is located south of uh, Botswana and probably in South Africa, it was detected by an NG sequencer. So probably we need to pay attention to Africa. In 2021, in November, from the uh, individual who traveled to Cameroon, a new uh, mutant or variant with IHU was detected in France. Fortunately, uh, this variant did not uh, cause a broad infection in France or in the world. Importantly, it is quite likely that the more uh, variants uh, appear in Africa. We have so-called stealth Omicron. You may have heard about it. Why stealth? Detection or finding this strain is not easy. So that's why it's called the stealth Omicron. It's called stealth Omicron because it's not, it cannot be found with a test to find Omicron. But uh, in, with usual tests, uh, this strain can be found. And it's called BA2. And there's another one, BA3, starting to appear. Sorry for busy slides, but as you can see, they have a quite large number of uh, mutations in spike protein, and uh, each strain has uh, different types of mutants. Now we have a lineage analysis, and the uh, Omicron BA1 probably started from alpha, and BA2, BA3 starting from different places. As such, Sahara Africa or African continent will continue to be generate other strains. Why is this? This shows number of new cases in each continent. Here we have uh, Americas, Africa, and Europe. Africa uh, is a very small portion. And probably, other than in South Africa, the testings are not done properly, so they cannot probably catch the new variants. So probably new emerging virus will start from Africa and will be detected elsewhere. Then where does the next new virus may come from? What about the COVID? 2019, the prior to the COVID-19, this was published in a paper in China, but produces a lot of uh, uh, coronavirus detection. And uh, this is only a part of it, and I'm sure that uh, there must be more species. And this is the uh, SARS and uh, Hubei was related to the current uh, COVID-19. And out of uh, beta, gamma, deltas, out of which gamma, delta are for avians, birds, and not for humans. So alpha and beta are two important uh, variants, alpha distribution and beta distribution worldwide. When you merge the two, this is what you see. Looking at this, Perhaps uh, Russia or are vacant, so to speak, but uh, all over the world, uh, coronavirus distributes and they are looking for opportunity to jump to humans. And what's important is that the uh, bat may hover them 
but it would not mean a direct transmission to humans immediately, but uh, but to human and the human to human infectivity must be built with certain period of uh, adaptation, so to speak. So variance uh, production takes some time. And if that's, it does not survive during that period, then it will not become a viable variant. So uh, from Chinese bats to humans, this infection was tried so many times, but some of them got adapted to the human infection, infection successfully and then developed into uh, the COVID situation. So 2002 SARS and 2012 Mars, and this is less known, but uh, in veterinary science, so this is quite important to the Guangdong, China, the bat to swine and uh, pigs. Many pigs got infected and died. Uh, this happened one or two times, and then 2019, COVID-19. So 21 century is a century of uh, coronavirus. Uh, next coronavirus may be waiting in line, so to speak. Then from where do they seem to appear? Uh, this is the possibility. Uh, bovine coronavirus exists. And this has some uh, receptors which may become susceptible to many other animal species. This is the adult cattle diarrhea virus. We have good uh, vaccine product, but in Japan, this uh, product does not work well in Japan. Then many bovine coronavirus cases and then it may transmit to something else. Uh, it's 1890, uh, bovine corona to human corona, such variant has been reported. And the US, it was not a uh, dominant uh, uh, outbreak, but uh, human coronavirus 4408, certain infection size was uh, reported. This was from a bovine coronavirus and other wildlife, and it may transmit to other wildlife as well. So bovine coronavirus may affect many other animal species. So the next virus candidate could be part of this uh, bovine coronavirus. So it should be contained in the species of the cow or the cattle. Uh, this is sometimes mentioned, uh, are bovines okay? Well, you don't have to be too concerned. Well, you can eat beef without concern, but uh, containment of the bovine uh, coronavirus is quite important, not to induce other variants. That is important. Then, in fact, how many uh, coronavirus or many other virus are waiting in line as an emergent, emerging uh, viruses? And you can see IPBES uh, published this several years ago. And uh, mammals, avians may hover 1.7 million species of uh, unknown virus, and a half of them, or 850,000 of them, are for potential zoonoses. You don't know them all, but is this a reality? Yes, a considerable number of them do exist, and they would become a zoonotic uh, pathogens. People in this field would agree with me. And with the infections, and of course, uh, in a severe case, this may occur. It's a sad situation. And what we feel actually is uh, economic loss or damages. With uh, COVID-19, the loss of $16 trillion. Uh, is this true? Or the actual figure may be even bigger? We don't know. 
But uh, those who are active in the stock trading, perhaps you know that the Omicron came in at the end of November and the stock prices plunged all of a sudden. That's what happened. So global pandemic or infectious disease may cause economic damage. So what can be done as countermeasures in the years to come? That's the last part of my presentation. This chapter has a conclusion. That is that uh, not to get wild animals infected with a new the emerging virus. For example, uh, new COVID, pups, mink farm got affected from the, the say, farm keepers and the mink got infected with the COVID and the one mink escaped and found, got found with the infection. In Netherlands, the three stray cats around the mink farm found to be infected. Spain, apart from the mink farm, were well, not particularly linked to the mink farm, but uh, 20 kilometers away, wild minks, two of them were found infected. Mink get uh, very high fatality, such as 10%, like a human SARS. So now it's spreading to the wildlife elsewhere. Brazil, this is not the mink case, but the wild cat, wild dog, one each got infected in the wild, so to speak. So wildlife are affected with this infection pandemic. What's bad about this? For example, from bat, then uh, wildlife born, infection to human and the human to human transmission and our companion animals, dogs and cats may get infected and the animals in the zoo as well as the mink or minks in the farm and so on get the infection back to humans. It doesn't have to be kept, but the wildlife get once they get the infection they would to hover their own uh, mutation so to speak it is not always uh, virulent but some of them would become virulent we have to be aware and with the further vaccination in humans uh, perhaps it will be contained but uh, what life have its own uh, pandemic and we're not sure whether the case is completely over or not. So what's important is that we have to have uh, the suppression of the appearance of the new infection in amongst the uh, uh, wildlife. This is my favorite uh, movie in order to be ready for the future. In US pandemic movie like that for one year, uh, you get the vaccine somewhere developed in a year pretty soon and the peace come back to the world, so to speak. When I uh, saw this movie, I thought this is unthinkable, too simple, too easy. But with the COVID-19, that was indeed became a reality, quick vaccine development, I mean. Uh, so the unknown virus, you know, to have countermeasures for them, we have to know that the universal vaccine for all kinds of virus must be developed. And panacea, treatment uh, drug has to be developed. And also wildlife uh, control is important. And the food antiviral effect is quite important. I would like to touch upon this a bit. And unknown virus, we reported about 40 of them by ourselves and publish the result. And we are going to have a TUAT CEPIR, and we would like to capture, detect, and publish new virus in hundreds. And out of which, a uh, couple of minutes, please. Uh, I would like to mention that the food-related uh, challenge we have 
I, in the movie, I mentioned that the vaccine was developed in less than a year. And the next viral infection, we may see a development of vaccine done in a year. However, with more variants in place, some vaccines lose their e efficacy. What's important is that uh, we have to keep variants away, so to speak. And perhaps uh, effective uh, food items is necessary for, and it was co-sponsored by Takano Foods, a private company, and the Miyazaki University. And they had the joint uh, research. Natto, Japanese fermented soybean product. And uh, they have, uh, this food product has uh, 80 different proteas. And some of them is uh, effective to contain COVID-19. And we mix, made a mixture. And the mixture prevented uh, cell infection of uh, COVID-19. So not all proteas can degrade the spike uh, protein of the not products. So in the country, yes, times, forms, and the traditional not food item may hold uh, COVID-19 back. That was uh, published in Forbes and uh, at the Times as well. So daily food items as such may be effective in our fight against uh, COVID-19. This is one of the first reports as such. And here, we, or I, believe that the research would be for the people uh, COVID-19, as a researcher, we uh, were uh, interviewed for comments, and I consider that uh, we should uh, look after the model case of our predecessors. Shibasaburo Kitazato said the mission of medicine is to treat diseases and to prevent them. This is really a principle, so to speak, and this is true for the researchers as well. Another 30 seconds, please. AMED research group, NIID, uh, Dr. Maeda had the group of uh, veterinary science research uh, so that uh, in humans, uh, human statistics are handy. They are readily available, not for veterinary science. So we our university decided to have uh, say, veterinary medicine network so that the NID and local veterinary association and the JVA will be connected by net and the new corona virus tests will be done and we would we are the contractor for this uh, research and the research based uh, network for the data provision will be given. And this is not uh, sporadic uh, testing for COVID-19, but rather when the pet owner carries them to uh, veterinary clinics, we would uh, test them for such infection. When they're being positive, then they have to be taken care of the vet clinics. But uh, if the negative, then somebody else can be a host uh, family. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitsutani, for a very interesting uh, talk with regard to the uh, antiviral compound and uh, with regard to the emerging of new viruses. Animal to human transmission often catches attention. In case of COVID, it came from COVID and going through other animals as a possibility. You mentioned that the human to animal or animal, domestic animal to a wild animal also 
has to be kept in our mind so we need to keep watching i have one question it may be a difficult answer bovine coronavirus you touched upon with regard to the uh, new unknown viruses, I understand that you conducted the uh, survey on those. Other than coronavirus, are there any uh, candidates of such infection for the future? Thank you for your question. I suppose next speaker, Dr. Shimojima, will talk about the SFTS. As such, uh, Bunya virus, according to the old category, now we have a new category, though. So such a group of viruses may come as a new possible emerging virus. I don't know that Dr. Shimojima may touch upon this. Now, bovine uh, viruses, we did the search on uh, domestic animals. Uh, by coronavirus is often found. This may not infect human beings, but uh, some of them may develop human infection. Cows are highly managed, so we thought there shouldn't be unknown viruses in cows. But as we start to look into this, we start to find the new coronavirus in bovine. So we hope this will not develop zoonosis in the future. Now it is time to move on to our next uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mitsutani. Next uh, lecture is to be given by Dr. Masayuki Shimojima. He's a, a chief of the Department of Biology 1 at the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Today, he's going to talk about animal models and the pathogenesis of an emerging infectious disease, SFDS. Now, Dr. Shimojima, please start if you're ready. Yes, this is Shimojima. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. But it's not on slideshow. No, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. And this is the International um, Forum 2022 for One Health. I'm very honored to be able to present here today. So I work in the National Institute of English Diseases Department of Virology 1. My name is uh, Masayuki Shimojima. And uh, I think uh, this was mentioned several times, SFTS. This is um, emerging uh, infectious disease. I would like to talk about uh, animal models and also what types of um, pharmacological treatments are available. SFTS, it is classified as um, emerging infectious disease, and recently uh, identified or recognized uh, infections are uh, usually called emerging uh, infections. And as you can see on the slide, we have Ebola hemorrhagic fever, AIDS, and Nipah virus. But uh, in fact, there are many more emerging uh, infections. Today, I will speak about the SFTS, which is uh, one of uh, these emerging infections. Now, this is not limited to emerging uh, infectious diseases, but uh, since they were recognized uh, more recently, 
they're not really adequately controlled by vaccines or treatments in terms of uh, symptom control or prevention. Now for SFTS, SFTS, this is an abbreviation, and this is the spell out in English, severe fever with a thrombocytopenia syndrome. And uh, SFTS is an abbreviation of this. And the Japanese uh, translation is shown at the top of this slide. This is an emerging infection and first reported in 2011 in China. This was uh, 11 years ago. This was an acute infection in humans with um, SFTS virus. Two groups separately reported this uh, infection in China, and the report was made in 2011. Looking at the current situation, SFTS usually are reported in China, South Korea, and Japan. China is a place where it was first discovered, and they have approximately 1,000 cases per year, and in South Korea, 200. And in Japan, as I will speak, several tens of people or dozens of people are being reported. Emerging uh, infections, if you check the virus um, sequence and the check and recheck all samples, you would find that um, two to three years ago from this point, 2011, this infectious disease was actually recognized, but actually it is possible that uh, it goes back much long, much, much further. At least in China, it may have been around from uh, 96 and in South Korea, 2008, and in Japan, uh, there was a patient that was reported in 2005, and uh, they went unrecognized for several years, sometimes a whole decade, before SFTS was uh, recognized as an emerging infection. Before the report in 2011, report about the patient of this type of infection um, was already there. For example, in China, diagnosis of unknown cause or human granulocytic anaplasmosis. SFTS first report was 2008. 11, but uh, before that, in 2008, um, HGA-like case was reported, but it was um, checked once again, just once again. And uh, in 2012, they found out that the patient that was identified in 2008 didn't have HGA, but SFTS. SFTS was recognized, but before then, um, people just saw fever, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and elevated liver enzymes in the blood. These uh, symptoms are common between HGA and uh, SFTS. Therefore, these patients were diagnosed with HGA. However, anaplasma phagocytophilum 
or uh, antibody against that were not identified in these cases. This is how these uh, cases were reported at the time. These are clinical manifestations of uh, SFTS. Uh, fever, I have already mentioned this, and also thrombocytopenia, and uh, some uh, lab test items are shown on this slide. SFTS specific symptoms or laboratory values do not really exist. In other words, for true diagnosis, we need to spe do specific tests against the SFTS virus. Otherwise, it doesn't lead to a proper diagnosis. And uh, what is the clinical course of this um, SFTS? This is a summary. First of all, there's an incubation period a symptomatic period after the infection. And in the case of SFTS, this is somewhere between 6 and 13 days. And then there is onset of symptoms, such as a fever, malaise, exhaustion, and the test shows a thrombocytopenia and a leukocytopenia and elevated levels of enzymes, liver enzymes and uh, also coagulation abnormalities. Sometimes neurological symptoms also appear. After that, this is an acute infection. Patient may recover or unfortunately die. If they recover, the symptoms that I've just explained and also the laboratory values that I've explained would improve uh, all of a sudden within uh, seven days or so, and there's no sequela. However, if a patient dies, what happens is very quickly after the onset of symptoms, within three to four days, patients may die. So the progress is extremely fast. So um, multi-organ failure and the DIC would be the cause of death. Fatality rate is uh, about 30%, quite high. And uh, on this slide, you can see China, South Korea, and Japan, where most cases are reported. And uh, this is um, more detailed information about Japan. In 2013, the first case was reported in Japan. After that, um, the national system started capturing uh, the cases of this disease. So in 2013, it was 40, and then we went up to 60. Uh, it was 102 at one point, and last year, 68. So just under 100 cases constantly being reported. Left bottom slide is the age split of uh, the patients. 50 and older, elderly a population is quite large, and the total number of patients you can see over here, and this is number of deaths. Many elderly patients and many elderly deaths. <laughs> Some onsets occur among uh, the young, but uh, fewer people young die uh, among the young population. As I have explained earlier, fatality is uh, quite high. This is quite uh, unique to this uh, disease. Because of uh, the reporting system, it is very difficult for us to understand the actual percentage of uh, fatality, case fatality rate. But according to some survey, some uh, study, 27% uh, fatality in Japan was reported. And uh, also in China, they tried to calculate this accurately and came up with 18%. So the numbers are slightly different, but either way, 
Even at the single digit percentage,、uh, we say that the fatality is high. So, 18%, 27% is extremely high case fatality rate for sure. Within Japan, where do we find the patients? This is the estimated、uh, area of、uh, this endemic. It's not nationwide, including Fukuoka Prefecture, West Japan, specifically Kyushu, Shikoku, and the Chugoku、uh, Central Japan area. This is where the cases concentrate. Last year, we had、uh, some patients in Shizuka Prefecture. This is the east end of this region. And then there was a retrospective、uh, study conducted, and they found that、uh, there was actually a patient in Chiba Pre Prefecture in 2017. And、uh, this is a、um, monthly、uh, case trend. And、uh, it's very obvious that、uh, summer to autumn during the warm seasons, we see more cases reported. And、uh, I will talk about this、uh, later.、Uh, this is really closely related to the、uh, transmission route that I will explain later on. Now, where do the reservoirs come from? To human, and how is it circulating? I would like to explain that using this slide. First of all, we have ticks, not the kind of、uh, ticks that you find in your bed, but、uh, in the grass area. And、uh, within these uh, ticks, um, vertical transmission is、uh, taking place. In addition to that, we have animals. These、uh, pictures are、um, domestic animals, but wild animals are also included. As Dr. Mizdani said, wild a n i m a l when they get involved, it complicates the situation. So the tick would、uh, affect、um, domestic animals as well as、um, wild animals. And the ticks bite these animals and suck the blood to survive and then、uh, infect these animals with virus. And sometimes、um, the ticks suck the blood of human, and this leads to the onset of、um, SFTS. Although not reported in Japan yet, in China and South Korea, we have also confirmed this kind of case where there is a patient and also. Uh, healthcare professionals or family members taking care of the patient, and the virus sometimes is transmitted from human to human, although it's quite rare. And、uh, in Japan, we have seen many、uh, cases where mostly cats, but sometimes、uh, dogs, get the virus from the ticks and they get symptomatic, and the virus is passed on to the human. To the owner of these、uh, animals. This is another route of infection. Those,、uh, the size is about、uh, several millimeters. It's called Hemophysalis longiconis or Ambioma d e s t u l i n a r i u m This is after it binds to. Get the blood. Then, when they bite, they transfer viruses too. In China, Korea, Japan, over the sea, we see a、uh, same type of infection. We don't imagine that these ticks can travel over the sea. Then, how come do we see this disease coming from the same virus? Then, hypothesis is that、uh, this is a Korean doctor, probably this virus. 
from tick may trouble with migratory birds. And this is an island in Korea where migratory birds stop over. And uh, these birds can travel in these regions and they may be involved in the transmission of virus to humans. In Taiwan also, we see SFDS cases and further south in Vietnam and uh, Thailand, although number is smaller, we see SFDS patients. Now, let me now talk about the animal model and the development of vaccine and uh, drugs. For development of vaccine and the drugs, animal model is often used in others' diseases also. And in case of SFDS, we have a mouse and a knockout mouse and monkeys also developed for this purpose. In usual or ordinary mouse doesn't develop the disease after inoculation, but the knockout mouse uh, does develop disease. So to develop vaccine and therapeutic drugs, such knockout mice are often used. Or mouse blood uh, can be humanized, and such humanized mice are used as a model. I earlier talked about the cats, and cats are quite sensitive to this uh, virus. And uh, in humans, fatality is around 40%, and in cats, it's around 60%. So it's for the sake of uh, treatment for cats. But uh, once cats get infected, it can transmit virus to humans. So. Researchers on cat disease uh, can contribute uh, to uh, humans as well. And the monkeys, compared to uh, cats and mice, uh, these monkeys are closer to humans, so they are in an important position. And the challenge is that uh, they are more expensive and the larger in size, so handling of these animals can be dangerous. When a larger amount of virus is inoculated, the antibodies' uh, efficacy may be seen, so monkey model can be a useful one. This is an experiment result where I was involved in day zero virus was inoculated and uh, after which uh, the viral load increased and after antibodies uh, dosing, it decreases smoothly. Right hand side is a symptom score and uh, when antibody serum is administered, uh, serum scores go down. Using these animal models, vaccines and the drugs are being developed. None of them have been approved yet, but uh, these are virus vector or plasmid based vaccines candidates. And as therapeutic drugs, sorry for busy table. Left hand side uh, shows the uh, candidate of drugs, for example, mice and hamster. 
uh, showed efficacy in these cases. I'd like to talk about the two of these. One is Avigan, anti-influenza drug already approved in Japan. It's not shown here, but the clinical trials are being done. If it's used in early phase, it may show uh, efficacy in SFDS. Another example is calcium channel blocker. This is used in humans for the treatment of hypertension and the angina. Many SFDS patients are elderly and they may be receiving uh, treatment for hypertension, for example. According to survey in China, when they receive such treatment, they are less likely to die from SFDS. So these uh, calcium channel blockers may work for SFDS too. Now, in our institute, this uh, emerging infection, SFDS, uh, have been one of our themes of uh, research and development. We think this is a challenge we need to solve rather quickly. One is about uh, diagnosis, the quick diagnosis that can be used bedside. Current diagnosis is based on PCR test. Uh, the sample has to be brought to the laboratory and the hours are required to get the results. So new uh, diagnosis test that can be used at the bedside to show the results in 20, 30 minutes so that the drug treatment can start earlier. And also treatments or prevention uh, need to be developed further because none of these have been established or approved yet. So this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shimojima. Uh, Dr. Shimojima talked about uh, SFTS in a very organized manner. SFTS virus, from the viewpoint of One Health, may start from cats and dogs to infect humans in some cases. So. I believe this is going to be a, one of very important uh, infectious diseases. I have one question. Vaccines against SFTS are not approved yet. Uh, any plan of uh, clinical trials of vaccines or when it infects the uh, cats, uh, fatality is quite high, such as 50% uh, or 60%. How about the SFDS vaccination for cats? Any information or any idea you may have? Well, in human, with regard to clinical trials, as much as I know, I don't think any programs are ongoing. In cats, yes, fatality rate is high and uh, it can involve humans and the uh, feasibility is higher. So I may say maybe clinical trials in cats may be conducted and when the results are positive, uh, that may lead to the vaccine program in humans. Thank you very much. SFTS uh, is going to be a very important infectious disease that we need to uh, take care properly. I hope uh, for the success of your research and development. Thank you very much. We would like to move on to the next, uh, lecture, next, next presentation. We have a Dr. Masayuki Horie, Professor, Laboratory of a Veterinary Micro Microbiology, Division of a Veterinary Sciences, Graduate School of Life and Environmental Sciences, Osaka Prefecture University. 
and the lecture is titled to the next emerging viral disease control large-scale metavaromic analysis and characterization of the identified viruses dr horia the floor is yours thank you i would like to share my screen my name is Horie from Osaka Prefecture University. I appreciate this opportunity to present today. I would like to discuss mainly my research and I would like to share how we are searching for new large scale virus existence, so to speak. Uh, it may have up somewhat with the previous speakers, but I would like to talk about my research, which is based on the publicly available databases to search for new viruses. And the first two topics, the, there has been not enough done for the viral research, so to speak in the past because uh, so many are still unknown, so to speak. And known viruses is uh, only 0.007% of the existing one. So most of the existing uh, viruses are unknown to us. We don't know about them. And uh, in the past, the viral search was uh, putting so much emphasis on diseases, on humans, animals, and uh, crops. However, newly emerging uh, uh, infectious diseases are mainly caused by the totally unknown viruses. This is a classic uh, viral research. And uh, isolation and culture from the eggs and other proteins and so on. This is the search golden standard, so to speak and uh, needs susceptible cells or animals for this particular methodology. So many viruses are not culturable, so to speak, and it's so labor intensive. Another common method is the consensus PCR or other PCRs. Consensus PCR, as I have uh, indicated, uh, related uh, virus and highly the preserved uh, regions are set with the primer so that you can detect the many other viruses. And uh, this is applicable to unculturable uh, viruses. And also it has a larger range of uh, search, so to speak. However, it's based upon the known viral sequence. Therefore, totally unknown ones may be harder to detect. So these are the shortcomings of the classic uh, uh, virus search. And uh, in order to cover that, deep sequencing or next generation sequencing uh, came to light. This is a powerful detection method. It's a comprehensive uh, readout of existing uh, uh, bases of the nucleic uh, acids, as you can see, this is how it's done. Nucleic uh, acid and the fragmentation, and then sequence uh, reads based upon 75 to 150 uh, bases, and the nucleic acid can be uh, sequenced, so to speak. These are the machines. And uh, in a day, it can obtain a sequence of uh, 39 billion bases, so to speak. So it's really a comprehensive uh, virus search, so to speak. It, this does not require any culture and broad uh, range and does not rely on known virus information, so to speak. This would cover the shortcomings of the existing uh, viral search methods and how many viruses being searched and detected. This is where deep sequencing came to light. And the, with its usage, the viral detection increased so much. I use this particular method as well for my virus search, so to speak. I'm motivated to find unknown uh, virus, especially from 
uh, asymptomatic animals, as Dr. Mizdan said. What I'm uh, interested in is that uh, animals of uh, low interest, that uh, they are not research subjects uh, too often, so to speak. But the uh, deep sequence uh, application takes time, labor, and cost. It requires uh, sampling. It is time consuming. Uh, nucleic acid extraction is a very minute uh, procedure. Uh, it takes time and money, and also sequencing and library creation are time consuming, it costs money, and uh, viral readout is only a part of it. So uh, comprehensive or universal deep sequencing is not a way to go. So we paid uh, attention to what's available around us. NCI, for example, this is the US uh, publicly available database, SRA, sequence readout archive, so to speak. And this is the virus. And uh, birds, why they're appearing in red, this is not related to a virus, but uh, it is used for the other research. And the many of the animals used are healthy and intact, so to speak. And by having their sequence uh, such result, uh, perhaps uh, we may be applying it to the discovery of uh, new, unfound or unknown uh, virus species. And this is one of the application of the public uh, data. Avian SRAs, more than 5,000. Mammals, more than 41,000. So many terabytes of data has been processed with the supercomputer. Viral origin readout of the sequence, uh, there are many. Yes, 150 base uh, uh, has been done. And then we are going to have a short read assembly contig and the virus-like sequence would be derived. That's what we have done by using a blast on the way. And as you can see, about as little as uh, 900, the RNA virus has been detected. Maybe much more We, if we are to allow the range even bigger. Virus family and uh, detected host or host uh, animals. And as you can see, this is a taxonomy of a host. There are variety of animal species listed here, as you can see. And many of them are new and novel, so to speak. For example, this one, hepatovirus. This is the hepatitis A of humans belong to this particular family. And uh, hepatitis uh, E uh, virus, hep virus. And you can see this is uh, Garago. Hep virus was associated or related to that. And Delta virus, birds, Uchak, and others are uh, found to be the host of the newly found uh, viruses. By reusing the data, we may come up with a novel virus. So publicly available database has not been uh, utilized so much for this purpose, but they found out to be a great treasure box for wildlife uh, physiology or other research on animal physiologies can be leveraged with this uh, usage of the publicly available database. And there are so many uh, data analysis for virus characterization. Let me share some of the examples with you. For example, uh, Delta virus were detected from uh, Kinkacho, Tiny Pigua, Guttata, or the U Uchak. 
and the white tail. Delta virus is uh, not a familiar virus, I know. HDD was um, identified very small genome, a circular, a single strand RNA virus. It has satellite virus, bit HEP virus. Um, it cannot produce virus on its own, but uh, HPV envelope, if it is available, then it can uh, surround uh, HDV and uh, replication becomes possible. It's very unique. HDV, HPV, externally they're the same, but internally they're different. And the uh, HPV satellite virus uh, is supported by helper virus. And this is uh, the, how the viral uh, particles are uh, made. And it's a very important pathogen because it exacerbates uh, B. HDB was discovered in 77, and the Delta virus was um, categorized, but we have not identified any other viruses in this category. But from 2018, uh, in many vertebrae, many more viruses were identified in this uh, category. So HDB from HDB is quite far, but we have identified them. And for helper virus, we have uh, identified arena virus, which is completely different from HBV working as helper virus. Now, is there a spillover possibility? And uh, what are the helper viruses for the other viruses? We didn't know. So we uh, conducted characterization for the newly found viruses. This is a new Delta virus. I will skip the details, but genome structure is very similar to HDV. And 60% uh, or 70% amino acid matching or concordance with the existing ones. So these are the very similar viruses. Uh, other species also infected. We did um, wide scope research using public data to identify the reads uh, from Delta virus. And also we accessed um, animal samples using RT-PCR. And the uh, read from uh, public data, many of them are short and we have to map it against the viral genome that we have found and uh, they get attached uh, in different places. We count the number of reads that are mapped. And uh, for the white tail vaginosis, we did not really find, but for woodchuck, for various um, age groups, we have uh, identified the infection in woodchuck. In the bird, passeriform, um, wide variety of uh, species within this were, have this uh, virus, as you can see on this list, and uh, also in many different types of organs. So when we have a sequence from a virus, we can reconstruct the genome and uh, do the comparative uh, analysis as well. And woodchuck and bird samples were investigated and we identified the Delta virus, which is similar in Lontura striata. And the genome was uh, sequenced. So there is spillover within the bird species. Delta virus was uh, identified in this uh, pathogenic tree. All, all the positive ones are shown here. And uh, this is uh, across three different families. What's really interesting is that the Delta virus that was uh, identified uh, almost identical, 98% uh, identical. This is a very basic story, evolution of virus. We had uh, ancestors in the animal kingdom and they were split into different uh, species. And the virus is also um, splitting together with the species splitting. In which case the phylogenic tree shape is the same between host and the virus. But if there is crossover, the species uh, evolved according to the black line, but the virus is uh, spreading over to other species, in which case the phylogenetic tree shape is completely different. So as you can see, there is a spillover and also co-splitting 
And according to the data that we have obtained, we have tried to understand how the evolution has taken place. HTV speed of uh, evolution is uh, one location per 1,000 basis per year, 0.1% uh, rate of um, mutation. However, Delta virus, which is very similar, um, this actually split uh, 44 million years ago. And there is no uh, co-splitting. And uh, more recently, uh, among the bird species, spillover must have happened because of this uh, shape. Delta virus, if you look at the general phylogenetic tree, host versus a virus, this is a virus. There's no matching between the two shapes. And uh, deer and rodents, well, rodents and uh, people should be closer, but uh, the virus uh, between the deers and the uh, people are closer. So there must have been a spillover as well. Although I have not really included this in the tree, that the virus was identified in bats as well. And the possibility of spillover to human is uh, investigated. Delta virus identified through data analysis analysis and among different bird species across the family, we have identified possible evidence of a spillover. And uh, spillover is one of the driving force of the evolution of Delta virus. Now, this is what we found from the data. But what about at the cellular level? What is happening at the cellular level? We did some uh, experiments as well. Unfortunately, we could not isolate the virus itself. So we created a system to create or synthesize the virus. So plasmids um, added to cultured cell. And this is bird and woodchuck. This is um, human HUH7, HUH7 cell. And uh, we found out the virus could replicate in either of these. Even within human cells, more than 60 days of sustained infection was observed in the woodchuck virus. This is very rare. And also, what kind of helper viruses are involved in creating the viral particles? HBV envelope helper virus was uh, introduced together in order to test whether viral particles would be produced. Envelope could not be taken advantage of, that's the conclusion. But um, RT-PCR assay was uh, conducted. In the case of HDV, we saw a Delta virus release, but in the other cases, we did not. And uh, also, only when there was a HDV the, the envelope, we uh, observed this um, result. So I spoke about the details of what we have done so far. Using public database, we um, identified a large volume of RNA virus. This is uh, probably a um, good strategy to reuse the data to find the virus. And also through database search, we identified new Delta virus and also found um, potential evidence that uh, there was a spillover in the past. And the uh, new Delta virus uh, does replicate within human cells. And the um, helper virus for new Delta virus is not Hep B virus. That's all we know. In order to see the infectivity to human, we have to identify specifically which helper virus is involved. Virus research and the virus um, characterization will be continuously conducted. And this is very basic, and this is just one researcher's perspective. But uh, we are hoping to contribute to the control of zoonosis. We are doing a lot of search. Other people are doing search as well. So hopefully we can create a big virus catalog with all that characterization data. And uh, even if we cannot take advantage of the data, hopefully uh, we can, somebody can use it in the future to control the infectious diseases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Horie. Metagenomic analysis is rapidly uh, spreading for this particular research field. However, metagenomic analysis was done, but uh, no 
work afterwards, but uh, Dr. Horie made an extra effort to make use of it, for example, to compare it with the in vitro experimental data and so on. This was quite interesting, and I invite your comment. Metagenomic analysis, in doing so, no virus or related virus will be found or detected. That's what most of the search is done, but totally unknown, totally different type of virus. How can we identify or how can we look for it? Any ideas to make it happen? Thank you. That's a very difficult question. Uh, virus uh, isolation must be there as a work. You have to harvest and isolate uh, a virus. We cannot abandon this method, but this is labor intensive. But machine learning can be applied. Virus-like sequence can be segregated from the data at first, for example, uh, metagenomic uh, sequencing would uh, give us a totally unknown uh, sequences. And maybe we may do a machine learning or high, uh, highly sensitive uh, structural analysis may capture different results so that uh, it's there but not known can be identified. That's the idea. Thank you very much. In the future, uh, including this uh, COVID-19, unknown vi virus research or search is going to be the key to forecast the emergence of new viruses. Very significant work indeed. And I'm hoping this uh, particular field of research would be advanced further. Thank you very much for your presentation. That concludes subcommittee one, zoonotic infections, merging infections.